greetings from Munich. I am doing this recording, this little talk uh, with uh, Travel Talks uh, Leicester. And uh, it's just a small description of my time I spent in uh, Gabon. Growing up in India, I uh, was very familiar with the natural environment. I grew up in, on the hills on the western parts of India. And um, I was naturally drawn to the uh, ecology and the ecosystem of Gabon. And that took me to Gabon. And uh, I spent a year teaching biology in Gabon. So this is the story of my time there. Okay, good morning everyone. It's lovely to see you all. We've got 45 people. Uh, this program, this talk will be recorded and it will be available on YouTube. So welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube in time to come. Um, we're very pleased and privileged to have Asifa Qureshi, who's speaking to us this morning about her time in the country of Gabon. Um, Asifa is actually speaking to us from Germany, where she's working in an international school. So thank you for your time. It's, um, I feel so privileged to have so many wonderful speakers who are giving so much time to us. And thank you so much in advance, Asifa. So I'll hand over to you now. So this is my first slide. It's, uh, it's what you see from, it's a, the aerial view of the country. It's what you can see from an airplane. And uh, as you can see, it's got good forest and it's got very, very good um, savanna land as well. There's plenty of grass as well. And uh, it is a country that is on either side of the equator, not very uh, far from the prime meridian. So the longitude would be five and 10. So it, it's around uh, longitude five, five east, uh, 10, 10 actually, 10 east. So yes, this is the beautiful capital Libreville. And as I've told you, it was built uh, by a number of people. They drained the marshy land there and built the beautiful town on it and they called it Libreville. Freetown. These are the taxis, lovely food you can find there, the capital, a good view of the capital. Some of the buildings are quite spectacular and these belong to embassies of different countries. So you will see that the building that uh, houses the embassy of Russia is quite nice. The building of um, other embassies are also really nice. But my favorite were these uh, trees and the street that I uh, I, I walked on and uh, uh, it was very close to my house. I lived actually just a kilometer from the Atlantic. It was very beautiful. <laughs> and on uh, from my from my uh, from from the balcony of my flat I could see bats every morning and evening they moved from the place they roosted uh, in the daytime to the place that they would uh, get their food and uh, so there were I, I think half a million bats that made the journey from uh, one point to another it, it was a beautiful sight very very beautiful Gabon has 13 national parks and the national park that's nearest to Libreville is Akanda National Park uh, I went there soon after I reached the country. And in Akanda National Park, you can see these beautiful, absolutely lovely tall trees. They are so nice. And uh, this tree is called the Akume tree. It is endemic to Gabon. Its wood is used to make acoustic guitars and also lightweight aircraft. The wood is also used to make high-end cigar boxes and things like that. It, it has a, a very sweet smelling raisin. And uh, because of all of these, because of its grain and because of uh, the way it turns out, it's highly valued. It's quite a big export of the country. And uh, in Akanda National Park, I also saw a chimpanzee. She was there. She, she was not scared of us at all. She came quite close to us and she allowed me to take her photograph, which was quite nice. Very nice. Yes, so a perfect place. Akanda has a lot. They have mandrels, they have uh, um, 
gorillas, but I wasn't able to photograph those. Uh, they, they were deep inside the forest and uh, we were advised not to go deep into the forest. But I, I, I'm happy with what I saw. I saw a lot, I couldn't photograph all of it, but what I saw was very nice, very nice indeed. As you can see, there were some creepy crawlies as well. And this one was, I think, 16 or 17 feet long, quite long. And uh, photographing it was so nice, such a great experience for me. A very important day in the calendar of Gabon is the marathon. And uh, it was in the beginning of uh, December. It was a two-day two event. On the first day, we all did five kilometer, and the second day, 10 kilometers. I, I'm not an athlete. I don't run. I do not run. I don't do any sport at all. But the atmosphere was so nice, and this was such a good occasion. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't. I didn't want to be left out, so I took part in it, and uh, I walked. I walked both days, five kilometers first day and ten the second day. It was a great experience. It was something I'm never ever going to forget. Really nice, and you know why? You can see here. You can see why I enjoyed it so much because it was like a walk in the park. Although that was the hottest day of the year, it was really warm that day, but we all had a good time. This is what I had just outside my lab. Imagine having wildlife at your doorstep. This is a red-headed agama, very beautiful, really nice. They're not always on grass. Sometimes you can see them on concrete as well, where they uh, sit to warm their bodies. They, they uh, can absorb heat from their surroundings and increase the temperature of their bodies. And then I had very good, flora as well. This is an orchid and this orchid is known by its other name. It's the, it's the vanilla. So I had vanilla right outside my lab. It was so nice, really beautiful. I just loved what was just outside my lab. I also had a visitor one day. It came into my lab. This is a malachite kingfisher a malachite kingfisher. I think it was injured. Maybe it was chased by a raptor and uh, it stayed in my lab for a few hours. When it felt better, it just flew out. From my lab, I could also see monitor lizards. Actually, there was a family of four monitor lizards that lived on the premises. I couldn't photograph them because by the time I got my, photo, uh, my camera out, they had uh, they, they'd gone, they'd vanished. But they were there, I saw them, and they looked lovely. They were very nice. Family, four families of monitor lizards, absolutely beautiful. And there was everything else you can imagine. One day, I also had uh, the opportunity of seeing a gray African parrot. It was very close. I was sitting under a tree, having my sandwich, and as you normally do, and a gray parrot decided to sit next to me. It gave me the, the opportunity to photograph it. And I think that that was also a very good experience. And then here you can see this beautiful agamas. They were everywhere. There were lots of them. They, nobody uh, chased them away. Nobody disturbed them. We let them live. On occasions, I also uh, made social visits. And on one such social visit, we uh, met the chief of uh, uh, a village. He he let us participate in ceremonies of uh, the village. There were lots of other people. It was a good experience as well. And one of the things that we did that day was listen to people's music. There's this young young man who had a beautiful um, instrument. It was just a simple horn, and uh, he made music with that horn. It it was really very nice. He blew through it and it, it's like a wind instrument. You could uh, hear a beautiful sound, like a bugle more or less. So you see here, it had a little hole. You had to blow through the hole and uh, make music. So I asked him if he would let me try and he did. And so I tried and uh, I, I also made a little bit of music that day. And it felt very nice. It was such a great experience. You can see everybody 
is interested in what I'm doing. And uh, at first they thought I wouldn't be able to play it, I wouldn't be able to blow into it, but I did. And uh, they, they were all quite happy with the sound I made. We also had the traditional music. So uh, one evening there was a band that played and um, it was like everybody knows Africa is a, a continent that a lot of good music comes out of. So we had this band. I don't remember the name of the band, but the music uh, that night was really, really nice. Very nice. I'm not really a city girl, but I, I enjoyed it. I am actually a country girl. So this is the countryside that I love because uh, uh, ecology is a special interest for me. I, um, I like e ecology and uh, uh, one day we took this road and we went to the south of the country. Now, to go to the south, you have to cross the equator. We crossed the equator and then we were in the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is slightly uh, fun because uh, I've just been in, to, in the southern hemisphere two or three times. Uh, we went to this beautiful river called the Ugwe. The Ugwe is 1200 kilometers. It's, it's a very important river. It uh, has its source in the Congo and um, it brings a lot of water. It has the, it's the fourth largest in terms of volume of water, in terms of uh, the amount of water it has. And so the Ugwe has some very, very beautiful forests. There are undisturbed rainforests in, in this area and the savanna grassland because the dry season is slightly longer in the south, in uh, the re, uh, basin of the Ugwe River, the uh, dry season is slightly extended. The country has a longer wet season and a very short dry season. And I have to say that uh, Gabon is not a very warm country. That's because it gets the Benguela current from Southern Atlantic. And this Benguela current we know is a cold current. So you get a lot of cold water and uh, so the temperature is around 30 degrees plus or minus 26 to 32 something uh, like that and uh, the Ugwe river like i said is very very important it is a ramsar site it's the biggest ramsar site gabon has nine ramsar sites now ramsar are, uh, is a convention under which wetlands are protected because uh, uh, gabon has a lot of wetlands Ramsar Convention has been um, uh, implemented there. And uh, this is a very big, very important Ramsar site. Beautiful. We had these boats and uh, we spent, I, I think I spent almost a week in the area. Uh, we did quite a lot of boating. We looked at all kinds of animals that live there. We had, uh, we had a good look at the ecosystem. And one of the uh, one of the most important landmarks here is the hospital started by Albert Schweitzer. Uh, if you know Albert Schweitzer was born in Germany or Alsace, he, he considered himself an uh, Alsatian uh, German. He uh, was born in 1875 and um, uh, he, he's a person who has left a very, very, very big mark on um, Gabon. Uh, along the Ugwe, we, we uh, took a boat and we went to this beautiful hospital that he has established. He established this hospital oh, more than a hundred years ago in 1913. It's a beautiful facility. And when I went there in 2000, 18, uh, they had, uh, they were doing very well. They had lots of patients. Their department of leprosy was functioning. They had 17 or 18 people in the department of leprosy. And uh, it was a very well run hospital. You could see that pe people were making good use of the facility that Dr. Schweitzer created. He created this hospital in 2000, in 1913, 12 or 13. And in the beginning, it was just bamboo and grass. He used only bamboo for building material and the roof was, uh, roofs were all made of uh, grass, uh, leaf and grass. But, uh, but uh, his premises had all this 
lovely equipment that he got. And now part of the hospital is a museum. And I took a photograph of uh, the equipment that he had brought with him from Europe as a, a doctor. He was not a doctor uh, in the beginning. He was, uh, he, he was more, um, uh, he, he started his life as a um, priest actually. He went there for uh, relig uh, to, uh, as part of the church. But uh, then when he turned 30, he decided he wanted to study medicine and he wanted to look after people of the area and he, he wanted to um, build a medical facility that would benefit the region. And uh, so at the age of 30, he finished his degree in medicine at uh, the University of Strasbourg. And um, uh, so he is a very, very important, very integral part of that region. Albert Schweitzer, uh, as we know, was a polymath, a polymath because he was a theologian, a, an organist writer. He was a philosopher. He, uh, he actually funded his hospital from the money he got as a writer. He wrote many books, lots of books, and um, all the money that he got from his books was used to create the hospital. And uh, uh, you can see that the facility he has made has changed over the years, but it's still there. There is his legacy and uh, his legacy is there. And I think the uh, president of the country is also very proud of his legacy. So uh, although they have built a new Dr. Uh, Albert Schweizer hospital, uh, I think four kilometers from the old hospital, they haven't changed the whole hospital at all. The old hospital is still functional and it's still doing very good work. Very, very good work. So yes, from the hospital, again to the ecosystem and um, uh, this ecosystem looks very quiet and placid and calm but it's full of crocodiles so you have the nile crocodile you have the uh, slender snouted crocodile and the dwarf crocodile there are these three varieties of crocodile living in uh, these waters and you have to be really careful you can see that there are these very simple boats very very simple they carved out of logs of trees so you can uh, take a couple of oars and explore the lakes and the uh, waters of the Uguay river you really have to be careful though so uh, the sunsets like i said i spent over a week the sunsets in this area are absolutely spectacular very very beautiful when the sunsets uh, over the forest, it looks very nice. I just loved it. Every minute was was beautiful. Every minute was enjoyable. It was there was so much to see, so much to learn, and so much to understand. And like I said, these waters look very placid. They look very, very nice and inviting. And over here, you, you feel as if there's nothing. But these treetops were full of bird life. There were cockatoos and parrots, and there were all kinds of birds, beautiful, beautiful birds. And one of the things that I was really in pursuit of was the pygmy hippo. And I did see it. I saw the pygmy hippo. It's a very shy animal. I think it was here somewhere. It was at this point, and then it saw us. And when it saw us, it jumped into the water. It went into the water. It could see us. We couldn't see all of it. But he was just as interested in us as we were in him. I really loved the sight. It was beautiful. By the time I got my camera out, he had dived into the water and I couldn't take a proper photograph of the whole hippo. But you see these hippos are very closely related to another very important inhabitant of this region. And uh, that is the whale. The whale, uh, there are about 20 species of whale in the Atlantic. They don't come into the waters of the Uguay River, but the Uguay River has, uh, has a manatee, um, uh, has manatee living in it. Now manatees are not like porpoises or dolphins or whales or sharks. They're completely different and they are related to the aardvark. They, they are closely related to aardvark. And, uh, I wanted to have a look at um, 
the manatee, we went looking for it, we couldn't see it. It's, it's very important uh, to protect this area, this uh, habitat, because uh, manatees are herbivorous. And if we protect the habitat, manatees will survive. We saw pug marks of a leopard, of a panther, and we didn't see all the big animals we were trying to find, but uh, a little frog decided to make friends with us. He was really nice, he let us take photographs. And here is the guide, here is uh, Cyril. Cyril knows everything about the area. He, is, he knows every branch, every tree, every animal, every bird. He, he is a brilliant guide. He uh, showed us the uh, entire area. And here you can see mangroves. Mangroves are an important habitat for the manatee which is a precious animal. And uh, uh, then uh, from the ecosystem, I was back to my work, teaching. Teaching is what I like, teaching is what I do. A classroom is, I think, the only place where I can express myself. And uh, I really enjoy connecting with my students and telling them what I know. So now you will see some of my star pupils these are absolutely brilliant people they're very clever they loved the work uh, we were doing in uh, the institute i was working for and uh, they they were very eager to learn it was a brilliant experience teaching them this is our star pupil he is bilal ali bongo who is the son of the president of the country very respectful, very kind, a really good young man. And this is one of my colleagues who is dressed in the uh, traditional clothes of Gabon. He's wearing the traditional robes of um, Gabon. So it was nearly time for me to go home. We all met at the end of my academic year and then all went our separate ways. It was time for me to go home. This was the end of my journey in Gabon. It was a brilliant journey. I brought lots of good memories. I have some, I met some good friends. I met some nice people and I made good friends, but uh, I also uh, interacted with some really, really good students and got to see the wildlife of Gabon. Not as much as I would have liked to, but uh, uh, even then it was quite good. And the town, it's, it's quite a nice town actually. And uh, you can uh, see the town very easily because taxis are easily available and they're quite inexpensive. You don't have to take a taxi for yourself. You can share with other people. Lots of food available, nice and fresh. This is what the town looks like. It has uh, almost 50% of the country's population living in there. And there are only 2 million people in the entire country. Uh, if at all, it could even be less. So here you have a good view of the Atlantic. I love this tree. I don't know why. I, I liked it so much. I had to share a photo of it. This is the avocado my husband was talking about. So when I went to India, when my year was over, I took uh, an avocado seed and we planted it and it's this size in our house in, in, in India. Uh, so then, yeah, yeah, I spoke about the beautiful national parks. There are 13 of them, and these national parks have primary forest, which means the forest has not changed for thousands of years. And the prime, the most important species here is the akume, which is a light wood. It's used in making all kinds of things. It's um, sent to Europe and China. And they've sent it to Europe and uh, Europe historically. They've been exporting it for a long, long time. A chimpanzee and then the forest that I found that chimpanzee in, she was here in this forest. This is the Akanda National Park. The Akanda National Park is very rich in biodiversity. And then the marathon that uh, uh, saw about 17,000 people from all over the world. More than 17,000 people participated in this marathon in the beginning of December. It was a major event, very, very nice, absolutely fabulous. And I had to take part in it. I'm not a sportswoman, but I had to be there.
really enjoyed it. Very nice. And a little about the wildlife I saw outside my lab. It was right there. This is vanilla, which is an orchid. It grows very easily in the ecosystem. And um, because we have such a rich biodiversity of uh, plants, there's also a lot of animals, lots of birds, lots of mammals, lots of reptiles, lots and lots of reptiles. This is a malachite kingfisher. And so there are birds everywhere. It's really beautiful. The gray African parrot. And again here, this is red-headed agama. And this is the, 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 the people, I, these are the people I socialized with on a few occasions. Lots of music was made. It was very nice, very interesting and very simple. And then there was music, the traditional way as well. We had these concerts, which were really nice, very, very nice, very enjoyable. I went to one of them, the country roads of Gabon. This is what they look like. They're really nice. The equator, the experience of standing on the equator is amazing. It's really good. Absolutely beautiful. The Ugwe River, which is the largest oh, river in the back on the railway. Yes. The river. You can actually drink this water. It's very pure, very clean, and it's absolutely beautiful. And here we talk about Albert Schweitzer, who won the Nobel Prize in 1952. He lived for 90 years, and most of his life was spent in Gabon. He, like I've said before, was a polymath, done a lot of work outside of Gabon as well. And uh, he says that he drew inspiration from India, India's philosophy, and the way people have lived in India for a very long time. Okay. Um, I've been reading a little bit about Albert Schweitzer and his life. Um, in the coffee time, as you might say, um, and they had a daughter. Um, what became of of their daughter? His wife was named Helene, and they had one daughter. What became of her? Do you know? Uh, can I answer this? She was in uh, Gabon for a long time, but uh, I think... Eventually, she moved out of Gabon. They built a house in Germany. So either she's moved back to Europe or gone to America. But she did not spend uh, too much time in Gabon. Yeah, she's, she died. Um, I, yeah, I was reading about her, but I can't remember. She died not so long ago. Um, she lived a great age. But, um, and there is, there is actually, I think she... I think she founded um, um, a charity, the, the Albert Schweitzer Trust or something, which you can you can Google and you can read up about that, um, which which today campaigns to um, make life better for animals, advocates for animals. So that that's quite interesting. Did I hear you, Asifa, correctly? When you said that um, Albert Schweitzer wasn't only a, a doctor, did, did I hear you say that he, he trained in medicine later in life? Or was that his first, that his first study in medicine? No, that wasn't. He went to Africa as part of the Lutheran Church. And he went there as a preacher. But then at the age of 30, he came back and uh, uh, he registered he uh, took admission in Strasbourg and finished a three-year degree. He finished it in six years. So that was his uh, second profession. A third, actually. Uh, he started off with an organist. So he was very good at music. Very, very good. Very good. He was, I think, related in some shape or form to our Mozart or one of those uh, well-known musicians. And... Um, uh, he was a musician first, then a preacher, and then finally a uh, doctor. 
of course, <coughs> philosopher and all of that. So that's why yeah, he was. <coughs> yeah, he was a doctor of philosophy and music and also theology, wasn't he? And then he eventually became a, a doctor of medicine. Um, so yeah, he's an amazing man, actually. But a friend of ours, Nigel, he came to the first path, but unfortunately he had to go. But he actually has lived and worked in Africa, you know, all over his life. And um, I've got a book which he wrote about where well, he's autobiography, really. And he has a little a piece about Schweitzer. I don't know if I could would read this. Would that be all right? Do you yeah. think if I could read this out? Mm -hmm. um, is that okay? Go ahead. Um, in some ways, he's a bit. He's not very. He's not terribly kind about Albert Schweitzer. But anyway, I'll read you what he what he wrote. Um, this little town is probably the best known place, that's Lamborghini where Schweitzer worked, um, in Gabon because it's the home of Dr. Albert Schweitzer's pioneering hospital. Um, and then he's, he's on a, a, a trip, so he's saying the bus dropped us outside the pretty but shabby Hotel d'Angleterre. We booked in and a, uh, a young man who'd been on the bus with us persuaded us that we should really go to Chez Choisier which meant Schweitzer's hospital. He accompanied us on a pirogue, a canoe across the river, and introduced us to Dr. Ari, who invited us to dine at a table lit, a lamp lit table with vegetarian food. Dr. Ari rang a bell and introduced us to the international staff and volunteers of the hospital. By then it was too late to go back for our luggage and we stayed the night. Albert Schweitzer was a great celebrity in his day. Born in Alsace when it was German, he was a gifted organist as well as being a pastor, a theologian and a musicologist. But he decided to become a medical missionary in Africa. So he went off to study medicine and having acquired the necessary expertise, he founded his hospital in 1913. As a German working in a French colony, he was interned a year later when war broke out, but he returned after the war to develop the hospital, funding it with his organ recitals in Europe and with donations from all over the world. He was a paternalist, which I think is a bit of an unkind way of describing him, who wanted to cure leprosy to help Africans rather than befriend them. He wanted the villagers who came as patients to the hospital to suffer no culture shock. So the buildings had to be basic. Families would come and cook. The beds were arranged in twos so that patients could have a friend or relative to watch and be with them. There was no electricity except in the operating theater. Um, and yeah. And then he's, he, yeah, and then he goes on a bit. But I thought I'd just read that bit. That's in a book by a guy called Nigel Watt, who has, um, he has, he publishes books about Africa. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna, I'm going to talk to him about that later because I think it was a, a bit of an unkind term to call him a paternalist. But anyway. <laughs> he's a philanthropist. Yeah, a philanthropist would be kinder, wouldn't it? Does anyone want to come in on that, on the Albert Schweitzer stuff? I know somebody said they would definitely read up more about him, and I'm certainly going to as well. It renewed my, my memories of reading about him, uh, Yosifa. So, so thank you. Sorry, Tricia. I, I spent a day at the hospital, and I, I also ate lunch at the table it wasn't vegetarian the meal that was served to us was very delicious it was oh, right well that would be that would make him very unhappy wouldn't it i'm surprised at that i would have thought they would continue that tradition really but no. anyway that's interesting <laughs> it was that's a very good meal and uh, uh, people who were suffering from leprosy lived on the premises they were being treated they were getting healed 
I don't think I could have asked for more. In my, my, from my perspective, it was a very, very good uh, place. A good and you said there is, they've kept the original hospital, but they have an extra sort of more modern building. <coughs> So what, what is healthcare like in the country as a whole, Asifa? Do you, do you know? I mean, you said there were 50%, was it 50% of the people live in Libreville? Yes. yes. Um, so Lamborghini, is that, is that a long way from Libreville? Not very far. Not, no. Not too far. 150 or 200 kilometers. It could be more, right. but not too far. Uh, see, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the healthcare. Of course, because of the nature of the country, they have uh, their own traditional medicine. They have holistic medicine, and they, they use their herbs and uh, you know, plant-based medicines for uh, simple ailments. But there is a hospital that uh, is uh, that's a cancer hospital, and I've been to that hospital. I've spoken to the cancer specialist there. He's doing great work, very very good work. And then uh, some Arab country, I'm not sure which one it is, Morocco or Saudi Arabia. They have a new hospital. They've constructed a new hospital, which is uh, very modern. It's got everything. And uh, for us, it wasn't a problem because we were given the assurance that if something goes wrong, we will be airlifted if we break a <clears throat> hip or something and we, uh, we, have, uh, we need to see a doctor outside the country, they would airlift us and, uh, they would, and they did do it in the past. They took people to the nearest facility and uh, I mean, I, I never worried about it, never, because we had good health insurance and uh, we were very well looked after. I have to say that the country is fairly well run, fairly well. The cancer hospital doesn't have the normal uh, conditions that uh, other hospitals have in other parts of the world. In terms of patient understanding, uh, women that uh, come into the hospital sometimes come very late because they're a bit shy to talk to the doctor or they're a bit uh, reluctant to discuss what's happening to them because, because of shyness and because of the traditional way of life. But uh, the facility is there. Since you have okay, report that Nigel Watts has just rejoined the meeting. I don't know if, whether he would like to share some memories. Hello, Nigel. Hello. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I had to go out and leave the meeting. I missed a lot of it. So probably, um, you know, all I can say is that my, uh, what about my visit there, I've only been there once, which was in 1971 on our way from when we were traveling overland from Zambia to, to here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you, I just read out the, the bit that you wrote about, right. um, yeah. did you hear me do that? No. I no, just you just joined. Yeah. Okay, I read a little piece that you wrote about Schweitzer and... About Schweitzer, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. It was quite interesting because it wasn't so long after he died and the, the people were still there, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, lighting the candle for him and everything else. So it yeah. was, quite, it was quite, um, quite interesting. And then, of course, we took this... this when we got to Lombar, uh, left Lombareni, we, we took this uh, lorry going north to Cameroon. Did you read that bit as well? No, because no, yeah. I just read the bit about Schweitzer. Yeah. So. No, we, we then got a, <clears throat> a tra transport north. They have this, I don't know, they still have this system um, of, of barrier de pluie. You know, when it rains very heavily and the, the road, dirt road, they close the road until it dries, which was quite efficient. So we had to wait till the road dried. And then we got this lorry going north to Oyem, which is a town in the north of the country where we were served a rather miserable meal of assiette anglaise by a gloomy French couple who'd lived there presumably during the colonial time. And then we got another lift with a dentist, I think he was, to the river which forms the frontier with Cameroon. Then we went across the, the river in a, in a canoe, two canoes really, either 21 and I went in the other because the, 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 they only operated the ferry if there was a car trying to cross. So we got into Cameroon that way. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. But one thing I, I, I noticed, I think at the beginning you were saying that things were not so expensive. I think in 1971, 
Libreville is one of the most expensive capitals, um, and it, it certainly was expensive compared to the other African countries we were traveling through. Okay, yeah, thanks. You're, right. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. I'll, I'll tell you what I said. I said yeah. that food is inexpensive. Yeah. So you can get a baguette with uh, the uh, street food I showed you, yes. or a sifa also. So that would be like the restaurants and things would be very expensive, yeah? They are. You're right. It's, it's uh, the 12th most expensive city on earth, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on what you're talking about. I was talking about street food and uh, what you yeah. could get. Street food, yeah, yeah, yeah. On barbecue. They have a lot of barbecues on the roadside. Yes, yes. Good. <laughs> yeah, somebody, I think your, <clears throat> is it your, your nephew, or Asifer, or somebody mm -hmm. was asking about, um, about uh, the lizard. Yes. Uh, wait a minute, let me find it. I, I have answered um, the question. Do they have small, have you answered it? Yes. Oh, okay, right, it was about, lizards, yeah, okay. But there are monitor lizards. Okay. Um, okay, and then, oh yeah, the equatorial swamp was drained to build Libreville. Is there any of that swamp left in Gabon? There is, I think. And yes. what, what grew and lived there? <laughs> because almost 85% of the land is covered in forest. Uh, they don't grow a lot. They get a lot of, they import a lot of food. So uh, it's not like a rice growing or a wheat growing country. It's not. So uh, agriculture is only found on uh, a little over 2% of the land because uh, most people have uh, an animal-based diet. So they don't grow many vegetables? Um, not really, but what I saw was heirloom. So you, you can find heirloom aubergines and you know heirloom. Oh, the avocado, of course. Oh, the avocado is extensively used. Mm. Uh, they're talking about trains. Oh, the and main religion. Yeah, trains and the main religion of Gabon now. Yes. Uh, uh, there are trains. They have the trains, but they don't use them a lot. No. Uh, I, I, I know I was told that trains are not used. Uh, I remember uh, hearing a story about um, these trains being used only on special occasions. So there was uh, a group of our students going prior to my joining. Uh, they were going on a field trip and uh, they couldn't get enough uh, road vehicles. So one of the students whose father was a railway minister uh, arranged for a train, especially for them. So uh, they got this train from the minister of um, railways and uh, all the students got into the train and went where they wanted to, <laughs> where they wanted to go. <laughs> Thank you, Asifa. Thanks for all the time you've put to this. It's very humbling yes, for us to, you know, people are so kind. And thank you very much. For I didn't have enough material, honestly. Uh, my photographs are all at home. So I've just had to manage. Yeah, it was really interesting. Thank you.